He said, uh, I saw you in this show last night, kid, and he said, I gotta tell you, he said, you're really natural. He said, really natural work. He said, really good work. I, I think I'd like the suburbs. He said, uh, tell me what you've been doing, what you've been doing uh, recently. And I said, well, uh, uh, I've been playing Shakespeare. Shakespeare, oh my God, Max, Max, Max. He said, give the boy some numbers, put him in school for six months or a year and take all that Shakespeare out of him. We can't have any of that. That Shakespeare, God, that's not natural at all. That's really broad stuff. We don't do that in movies. And at that point, I stopped looking at the crack in the ceiling. I focused on him. I stopped sweating. And I said, go fuck yourself, you know? I went to Warner Brothers, and uh, they said they'd give me a contract, put me under contract, if Nicholas Ray would put me in Rebel Without a Cause, with the possibility of playing the Sun and Giant. And uh, I went uh, and saw Nick, and he said he would put me in the film. And so I was put under contract to Warner Brothers for the sum of $200 a week, I believe I started that. Oh, don't worry. I'll figure out what we are going to do with them. Okay. Relax. You'll figure it out. I see Dean, and I see him work. I'd never seen acting like that before. He's way over my head. Uh, he's doing stuff that I just don't understand. And our relationship was one of a student and a teacher. He'd talk to me about acting. He'd stand at the corner of a soundstage and watch me doing my, you know, walking along. And he'd come and say, come here. What were you just doing? What were you just thinking about? Blah, blah, blah. And he'd give me a little advice. Or he'd come in and watch me secretly when I was doing a scene and tell me something about it. He was much different than any of the other actors. He told me that he had Brando in this hand saying, fuck you, and he had... Montgomery Clift in this hand saying, please forgive me, and somewhere in the middle was James Dean, and this is why he would be remembered. You ever been on a chicky run? Yeah. That's all I ever do. I grabbed Jimmy and I threw him into a car, and I said, until I saw you, I was the greatest young actor in the world. Like, you know, I don't understand what you're doing because I know that you are now, and I can't deal with it. I don't know how to deal with it. And he said, whoa, slow down. He said, uh, what's your drive for wanting to be an actor? And I only had the drive to want to be good. So he said, that drive will make you an actor. So my wife. And you're going to answer for it. Aren't you the one who married a squall? What's the matter, boy? Is you having a good time? Get him up, Brink. Everybody knows you got this coming to you. Jordy, no. Get him up, Brink. Just go. <laughs> Jimmy said to you were great today. My eyes teared up, and I got tears in my eyes, and they started coming down my face. And I said, thank you. And he said, you see what you're doing right now? He said, uh, see those tears? Those are tears to show me that you appreciate what I'm saying to you. But those are tears you shouldn't use in acting. He said, when you really have to cry, cry so that you have to leave the room. My first impression of Dennis was probably the first scene that we did on the film from Hell to Texas. He was a very, very volatile young man, and, and uh, uh, he had a terrible, terrible relationship with the director, Henry Hathaway. Uh, 
he was the most charming man at dinner. We'd have these wonderful dinners together. And he would tell me all these things. And like, you know, I'd say, Mr. Hathaway, now in this scene, you know, these things could happen. So I said, great idea, kid. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And the next day on the set, I'd say, but Henry, this is like, you know. He said, that's dinner talk, kid. Dinner talk. Now, God damn it, just do what I tell you. And he would give you line readings. He'd give you every gesture just on. And it was a nightmare. Dennis, it was kind of a... You know, like the, the bad kid in school that you're glad that he's there because no matter what you do, he, his behavior is so much worse that it lets you off the hook. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Dennis was like. He would question every direction that Henry Hathaway would give him, say, why? Why should I do that? Why should I go over here instead of going over here? My last day on the film, I had a 10-line scene, the weakling son of the bad man. And I came in the studio at 6 in the morning. He was there. He was so happy. He says, you know what those are, kid? And I looked, and there were film cans stacked. Like, he said, there's enough film there. I said, there's a film can. So he said, there's enough film there to shoot for four months. I said, wow. He said, we're going to stay here, and we're going to shoot this scene, and you're going to do it my way. We're going to send for lunch. We're going to send for dinner. We're going to sleep here. This is it. So I started at about 7 in the morning, and uh, I did this 10-line scene every way I could possibly think of doing it. We sent for lunch at about uh, 12.30. At uh, around 7, they sent for dinner. And uh, about 11 o'clock at night, I finally cracked, started crying and said, just tell me one more time how you want it. He told me, I did it, he printed it, and I left the studio. It was quite operatic. I mean, 86 takes, you know, in order to, uh, for one line. And just a matter of, I want it my way, and the director wanting it his way. And Hathaway was a very, very, very strong man. Also, Hathaway didn't give a damn. He was in the old school. It was. Uh, you know, he was king of the mountain. And Dennis was a very young kid, and uh, Dennis knew what he wanted. Well, it cost Dennis a lot to stick up for what he thought was right. Warner Brothers dropped me from my contract. And I couldn't uh, get any work in Hollywood at all. I was blackballed for being too difficult. When I went to New York to study with Strasbourg, I would go to Birdland and see Miles play, and we'd all hang out there, and we'd go to Downey's every day, and uh, I'd go to the actor's studio. It was an incredible time. Deranging my senses, I was reading Thomas Wolfe's uh, The Web and the Rock. Dennis is one of those people, if, he, if he's interested in something, if he turns his interest towards some, toward something, he's like a vacuum cleaner. He just <laughs> uh, absorbs it. I think he operated under the illusion that he could do anything he wanted and that he was a free, independent spirit. He was on the cutting edge. Dennis had an eye and an ear for what was happening at that time. And he was on the scene. If you wanted to know something about what the scene was, Dennis could tell you. I became very involved. Uh always in the art scene. I always felt that the art, that art was a very special place because there was something really incredible about the easel painter, or the studio painter, that uh, he could do his own thing, his own time, and not, uh, not have to compromise his images and his vision. He married uh, one of my sisters, a woman I call one of my sisters, Brooke Hayward. And uh, I didn't go to the wedding, but I went to the reception, and I met him. And I thought, this guy's a looney tune, but he sure is interesting. Dennis made me read Huxley's Doors of Perception, and it did sound a bit thrilling, all these colors and all that. So I agreed to take some mescaline, which, as I remember, was one of the most horrific experiences. He intrigued me further with the concept that really what he was interested in was film directing, not acting at all, film directing and that he was a superb photographer, although he didn't have a camera. 
I had to take it on faith that he was a superb photographer. All he really wanted was a camera. I'd never 